Hello friends, welcome to CEC Live Lectures. Dear friends, today in this session we are going to talk on business ethics and CSR that is corporate social responsibility and under the series we are going to talk on ancient education system and ethics and for the discussion of the topic we have with us in our studios Dr. Namita Rajput. Dr. Namita Rajput is a officiating principal in Sri Aurobindo Evening College University of Delhi. Dr. Rajput is a prolific professor uh, as well as a prolific writer too. Uh, her teachings as well as uh, her um, books are uh, read by the students community worldwide. So friends, if you wish to ask questions from Dr. Namita Rajput on today's topic, then do call us through a toll free number. Our uh, number is 1-800-110-430. I repeat, our number is 1-800-110-430. Now I would like to welcome our guest Dr. Namita Rajput once again and would request her to explain the topic in detail. Hello ma'am, welcome to the lecture. Good morning friends. Today we have a very important topic called ancient education system in ethics. The ancient education system has given us a lot in terms of the personal growth, in terms of you know the, the permutation combinations, in terms of the character building, in terms of the ethics. So which has uh, given a lot of uh, things for the personal growth of an individual. So with this backdrop, let me start with the, uh, the concept of the ancient education system, personal growth and business ethics. How it is related to business ethics will be a very important, uh, you know, the connection which we will take it later. Now what do you mean by personal growth? The personal growth means enhancement of self-esteem of a person. It involves applying a rational approach to one's thinking, involvement through in-depth understanding enrichment of life, reinforcement of the value system, growth of a person today is manifested in rich heritage of the education system, mathematics, economics, astronomy, medicine etc. So what have we learned here? We have learned here that when you talk about the personal growth of an individual, it is directly associated and linked with the ancient education system. How? It has given us uh, how we should think, the rational approach to one's thinking, the involvement of in-depth understanding of the personal life, how we can enrich our life, how we can you know adhere and enforce to our ancient education and value system and growth of a person today is manifested in the rich heritage which we have uh, in our uh, you know the education system of yesteryears specifically when you talk about the mathematics, uh, economics, astronomy, medicines etc. So this is a close association and link between the ancient education system and the personal growth of an individual today. What we are is uh, because of the ancient education system. Now the heritage of mathematics involves Brahma Gupta's indeterminate equations, permutations and combinations, sum of squares of n terms, Pythagoras theorem, value of pi and the astronomy includes heliocentric theory, the period of sidereals, rotation etc. The progress is improvement in the well-being of a people that is it can be identified with improvement in public life, religious observance etc. The progress means more than the economic growth. It means longer and a better quality of large proportion of people involvement in human welfare constitute progress. People realize progress when change results in any of these aspects. The longer life decreases in infant mortality rate, decrease in morbidity, increase in people's opinion and option, greater equality, more freedom, reduction in fear of a person and a people or their own rulers. Now, a major component of progress is improved life expectancy and diminished mortality infant deaths. Reduction in mortality is a very clear improvement in the physical psychological well-being. A related measure of progress would be the average caloric consumption especially in moderate income countries. In wealthy nations, this indicator is faulty, but for most other places, it relates closely to well-being. There are many arguments about what constitutes the progress. Now, we have seen 
that uh, when you improve upon uh, the theoretical backdrop in the theory specifically in the mathematics, economics, when you move uh, better in your life, you take better decision making, when there is reduction in infant mortality rate and uh, the life expectancy increases, the mortality de death rates decreases and uh, definitely when we are uh, near to the, the basic uh, consumption levels of a nation, especially uh, when you talk about the moderate income countries and uh, specifically when you talk about the wealthy nations. This indicator is very faulty, but most other places it is very closely linked to the uh, each other and, and of course for the well-being of an individual. Now, uh, there is a lot of debate in terms of what constitutes the progress of a country because we have different types of nations, we have low income group, we have middle income group, we have rich income group. So, each and every category of a nation has its own concept and the meaning of a progress. But yes, generally when you talk about uh, that when there is a rise in the well-being of an individual, the average rate of consumption uh, uh, goes on increasing, uh, when the mortality rates uh, overall and for specifically the infant mortality rate uh, decreases, we call it as that the nation is moving up and there is a total well-being which is spread around uh, the nation. But uh, definitely uh, the concept is little different uh, as far as the different categories of the nations is concerned. The progress has many aspects. The progress uh, leads to professional, personal and business. There are three types of progress when you talk about uh, you know anything. We grow in our profession, we grow in our business and we grow as far as the personal characteristics of an individual is concerned. Now, when you talk about uh, the personal growth, how does it uh, mean and how does it call a progress of a person? A person makes all efforts towards the improving one's own personal life, health, then community well-being, economy and all these constitutes the progress. Then progress is a change program so frequent and accurate. The assessment of a progress is essential to ensure that the change program is effective. Now, we have uh, you know taken care of three aspects as far as the progress is concerned. The, uh, the progress can be of an individual, it can be of a nation, it can be of a business and, and it can also relate to professionalism. We try and add certain degrees to our profession, a certain add-on courses to our profession. We try and inculcate uh, certain more habits of reading because uh, you know reading is a very, reading leads to knowledge, knowledge leads to wisdom which is a very important tool for the personal growth. So, if we keep on doing it that is a professionalism and the professional growth of an individual and followed by the business if you go and expand uh, uh, you know your business uh, adding more products to your uh, line, uh, moving on to the more green technologies, you know reducing uh, uh, the, the, the cost and increasing the quality. So, overall we say that there is a business growth of an individual where uh, wherever you are associated and linked with. So, it is a kind of a good change which you see and the change is always positive and on the rising side and there is a direct relationship of you know uh, moving on with the proceeds, uh, the sales, the profits of an individual because we are talking about the business also. Now, or everything whatever we owe, whether professionalism, personal growth, uh, your character, your business, we owe to our own education system and uh, the way we are brought up, the, the education system of the yesteryears because they are uh, you know give us the good value system under which we prosper, under which there is a complete upbringing of an individual. So, there is a kind of a baking of uh, that culture into the minds of the people and you grow with them. And when you grow with them, definitely you are not on a bad path, you are always on an ethical path which is definitely we owe to our uh, you know the ancient education system and this is how the ethics and the ancient uh, education system is very closely linked with one another. So, let us talk about now the education system in India that how and what has uh, been and how it is a biggest contributor to the personal growth of an individual and uh, of course the ethical backdrop. India is the largest democracy in the world and about sixth largest country in the world and one of the most uh, ancient and the living civilizations which is about 10,000 years old. 
it has uh, an ancient uh, tradition of education the world first university was established in takshila in about 700 bc the indian mathematicians introduced the the concept of the zero the decimal system and the method of multiplication education is highly regarded in india the state control the the school system and through the central government provides the financial assistance and the planning the primary schools are free of cost and official they are compulsory between the ages of 6 to 14 years of age and after that the students they have to pay for the education higher education in india has evolved in divergent and distinct streams where each stream is monitored by an apex body indirectly controlled by the ministry of human resource development the universities are mostly funded by the state governments however there are 12 important universities called the central university which are maintained by the by the union government and because of the relatively large funding they have an economic edge over the others the engineering colleges the business schools in the country are monitored and accredited by all india council for technical education that is aicte while medical colleges are monitored and accredited by the medical council of india apart from these the country has some engineering management medical education institutions which are directly funded by the union government now what is the concept of the ancient educational system the modern india has its deep roots in the ancient educational system a system that promoted the personal growth through the creative awareness about self and attainment of pure bliss the ancient system aimed to provide education to make people know about their culture and the value system and the cultural values promoted the wisdom and thus built the responsible persons now here it is very important to uh, make you understand that what the ancient education system is all about and how it has contributed to the individual and the personal growth of an individual now when you talk about uh, the modern education system it has its deep roots in the ancient education system because it builds your character it builds you and uh, puts you in a place and a place of bliss how the ancient system aimed to provide the education to uh, a large number of the people not only this when they give the education system when you talk about the yesteryears they try and give you the importance of the heritage the culture and the tradition of a particular system of a particular nation and when you are born with a very good feeling of your heritage of the culture uh, building etc you are in a state of a bliss you are blessed because you are you know uh, you have deep roots as far as the education system ancient education system is concerned because it is all about your culture your heritage and your value system what the ancient education system can give to an individual nobody else can give because we have you know lot of variety of epics like mahabharata ramayana which gives you lot of teachings bhagavad gita which gives you the importance of action which gives you the importance of good deeds which gives you uh, a very clear demarcation of what is a good act what is a bad act so you're born with uh, you know a circular movements around you of these uh, ancient epics which are surrounded uh, by you when you're born and brought up in that ancient education value system so you know not only uh, the individual is promoted and uh, there is a personal growth in this regard but yes uh, you, your cultural values are promoted you have lot of wisdom here uh, which is definitely uh, making you and uh, you are on a path of becoming a more responsible citizen because you are never on a wrong path you are trying to build up that culture that connotation that uh, feeling of having a right uh, uh, path on the uh, in the life which you take the ancient education system was uh, definitely based on religion and no religion in this world can give you a wrong teaching 
what religion can give you is perhaps the best thing because the religion always gives you a right perspective, right thinking, right path of an individual to stay. The education system was uh, you know regulated by the religions because religions uh, are a kind of uh, the bylaws uh, which an individual has to take care of that. Now it is views as a means of a self realization of salvation because what uh, these uh, you know religion can uh, teach you what this religion uh, whatever are the religions which are present in the in a particular economy can give you it gives you uh, and shows you a clear path of realization that whether and what you are doing is right or wrong one. Number two it gives you a show you know the way of salvation which is definitely a most difficult thing in the life to be achieved. It aimed to enhance the knowledge of an individual or a person rather than just developing the physical senses. So it makes you a beautiful person in and out how because it gives you a lot of uh, good feelings, a lot of good uh, value system, the heritage, the importance of culture which uh, when an individual is being brought up uh, it is baked into the mind of an individual and you are born with a strict convictions in mind because you have culminated the knowledge from these epics, from these traditions, from this culture which makes you a in good individual and you are thinking now on a right perspective of what is right and what is wrong and definitely. There was an intimate relationship between a teacher and a student which started with the religious ceremony called Upanaya that is a new birth. That means when you are uh, you know directly connected with a teacher. So there is a very close relationship of a teacher and a pupil uh, because uh, whatever a teacher gives you is a kind of a new birth, new knowledge, new value system, new thought system which was never a part of uh, you earlier unless and until you are linked with a guru or you, when you are linked with a teacher. So that is why we call it as Upanaya that is a new birth. Now according to the value system propounded by Hinduism, Moksha or the spiritual emancipation is the ultimate goal of life that is. It is the most perhaps the most difficult thing on this earth to find out the path of moksha or the path of spiritual emancipation that is how you are on a path of a moksha that is the ultimate goal of each individual's life and this is perhaps the most difficult one to be achieved. And for this purpose the ancient Hindu culture was divided into four phases of life which are called as ashrams. There are four major ashrams. The first is Brahmacharya, the second is Grihasth, the third is Vanaprasth and the fourth is Sanyasa Ashrama. So these are the four ashrams of life which are directly you know derived from our ancient education system which gives you a system of life that how you have to live and what you can do about it. Now we are talking here about the four ashrams that is the Brahmacharya, Grihastha, Vanupasra and Sanyasa ashram. Each ashram is signified as a particular you know the relevant phase of an individual's life which is definitely connected with your duties and obligations which you have to perform relating to each ashram of life which are you are supposed to fulfill. India has a rich tradition of learning and education. There <coughs> these are handed over from generations to generations through oral and the medium written medium. The highly esteemed Vedas that existed for nearly 2000 years ago before they are born in India guide our present lives. The knowledge of acoustics enabled the ancient Indians to orally transmit the Vedas from generation to generation. Nowadays if you also listen to the Vedas and the, the, the mantras you feel that that particular place where they are you know played and when where they are enchanted is a blessed place you feel lot of positive vibrations happening in that particular place. Uh, 
So, India has a rich tradition of uh, this learning and education and of course, uh, uh, the highly esteemed Vedas which existed almost now about 2000 years ago before they were uh, called the India guide or our present lives also. And uh, the knowledge of acoustic, uh, acoustics enabled the Indians to orally transmit the Vedas from generation to generation. Now, coming on to the institutional form of imparting the knowledge came into existence in the early centuries of Christian era. Now, see when you talk about the, uh, the Vedas, the Smritis, the Manu Smritis, the, the culture, uh, the heritage, the traditions, the, the overall the value system which is present in Hinduism, they have a very significant role to play as far as the business is concerned. And uh, you know the institutional form of imparting the knowledge, it started way back in the Christian era. The approach was learning uh, the way of the logic and epistemology. Unless and until you have uh, the concept of the logic and epistemology, you cannot apply uh, all these things into the present uh, contemporary world of today. That is uh, the study of logic was followed by you know the Hindus, the Buddhist and the Jains. And one of the most important topics of the Indian thought was pramana or a means of reliable knowledge that is pramana is the evidence that is you know when you uh, show to the, the individuals at large or the public at large or the society at large or the people at large. If whatever concept you say if it is supported by some kind of an evidence or a pramana the people believe that very quickly because the evidence or the pramana is the main thing which everybody is striving to see to make uh, your beliefs a strong convictions in life. So, this pramana or a means of reliable knowledge is most important as per the Indian thoughts are concerned. Regarding the institutional form of education, the first was guru shishya system that is like we have now uh, the schools, the earlier we have used to have the gurukuls in which when a child was born he was uh, you know given to a particular guru where he used to live a very hard life earn uh, you know uh, live there and try and inculcate what the guru says to him the the knowledge of dhanur vidya or the knowledge of upanishads the knowledge of traditionals gita ramayana mahabharata etc etc was made a part and parcel of those gurukuls. Then used to have a very simple life without any gadgets, without any you know the physical amenities, the, the luxuries of the life. They were supposed to lead a very simple life, eat very simple, live very simple and high thinking profile was inculcated in their mind. So, that is why the, the system of the education was a guru shishya system which was very very popular in the yesteryears. And now slowly um, the history repeats itself and now we are again moving to a, a concept of the of the gurukuls wherein the traditions are being followed they are taught about the importance of the education system they are talk about the importance of Upanishads etc. Now according to our sacred text the training of Brahmin pupil took place in the home of a Brahmin teacher because of the casteism in India. The first lesson taught to the student was the performance of Sandhya that is reciting of Gayatri Mantra. The family functioned as a domestic school and the ashram or a hermitage where the mental faculties of the pupil were developed by the teachers constant attention at the personal instruction. Education was treated as a matter of individual concern. It did not follow the method of mass production applicable in India in industry. The making of man was uh, regarded as an artist and not a mechanical process. The aim of education was developing the pupil's personality, his innate and the latent capacities. This view of education as a process of one's inner growth and self-fulfillment of all its own techniques, rules, methods and practices. So, we are uh, now talking about the traditional system which we had in India which is called as uh, you know the, the Guru Shishya system in which uh, when a pupil was uh, you know given to a Brahmin because the person was a Brahmin was trained by a Brahmin teacher wherein uh, the first lesson was uh, taught to him was uh, a mantra called the Gayatri mantra. The family functioned uh, as a domestic school 
and the ashram or hermitage where the mental facilities of the pupils were developed and the teacher constantly attention to the personal instruction. So, what that guru was supposed to do, he used to you know put in the best efforts to develop the mind of that pupil, that Brahmin pupil, wherein the mental capacity, the mental capabilities were developed by uh, inculcating into him uh, the, the best knowledge about the heritage, culture, etc. And uh, with the constant and uh, you know uh, the, the regular attention of the teacher to that student and the, the personal instructions, etc. The education was treated as a matter of individual concern and it did not follow the method of mass production applicable in the industry. The making of man was regarded as the artistic and not a mechanical process. The aim of education was developed uh, here was about the pupil's personality, his innate and latent capabilities which were never developed earlier. So, now it is the time for uh, the mental capacities to be developed by taking use of those ancient uh, Guru Shishya system. Uh, the, the, the pupil when he was out of that Gurukul was uh, made a very intelligent uh, you know the rational individual with all capabilities in his mind about his, his personal uh, innate uh, his mental capabilities were completely developed by you know adding into it uh, the various methods, techniques, rules, regulations etc. And of course, the various practices which was which were very important for him to build up his his mental minute. So, uh, I hope with these words uh, you have the concept of what education system has contributed uh, for the personality of an individual and how it is related to ethics. Thank you so much. With this note, thank you ma'am. Thank you so very much for giving us uh, this um, uh, session. Friends, you are requested to be with us as we are back after a short break and we are going to discuss more. Thank you for watching us. Hello friends, welcome back to this session. Friends, as you know that today uh, we are talking on ancient education system and uh, ethics and for the discussion on the topic we have with us in our studios, Dr. Namita Rajput. Dr. Namita Rajput is a prolific professor and through her we always get uh, in-depth knowledge. Uh, dear friends, through this session uh, we are uh, going to talk uh, on uh, the ancient Vedic Upanishads such as uh, uh, Manuspriti and all and if you wish to ask questions from Dr. Rajput on the following topic, then do call us through our toll free number. Our number is 1800110430. I repeat, our number is 1800110430. All dear friends are requested to call in the last 10 minutes of the lecture so that you could first have a deep insight. Now, I would like to welcome our guest, Dr. Namita Rajput, once again. Mm -hmm. Hello, ma'am. Welcome back to the session. So, uh, in this session, we will be talking uh, more on the Indian education system. So, let me have a recap of what we did in the previous session so that you have a lot of good connect and deep insight of what we did in the last session and uh, what we are going to do in the current session. We talked about the personal growth of an individual which was closely associated and linked with the, the concept of uh, the, the Upanishads, the, uh, the heritage, the culture of an individual. It involves a kind of a rational thinking which has been inculcated by all this uh, value system which is definitely a part of the Indian education system. 
Then we talked about the importance of mathematics, economics, astronomy, physics, etc. And uh, definitely the progress uh, in individual's life is very uh, and of course the well-being of a people is closely associated and linked uh, with the, the progress uh, of the economic growth and definitely which is uh, closely linked with the Indian education, ancient education system because what it teaches us uh, it is practical and if we apply practically we are on the way of salvation, path of good progress etc. We talked about uh, that how people realize the progress uh, when change results in any of these uh, longer lives, decrease in infant mortality rates, decrease in morbidity, increase in uh, the personal, uh, the option greater equality, freedom reduction in the fear and other uh, etc. When all these things are talked about, we say that the individual has really grown to a larger extent. And of course, the, the economic growth uh, when you talk about is again linked with the education system wherein uh, we talked about the good indicators and the parameters like uh, you know decrease in the infant mortality rate, uh, then improved life expectancy, then uh, diminished mortality infant details. Uh, of course, uh, if you are on a, on a path of good consumption, the average consumption is more then we also say that people are having good food to eat etc. And of course, so when you talk about your mental setup, you are able to take good decision making, keeping into consideration the value system etc. in the minds of the people. Then we uh, talked about uh, the importance of uh, education system in India which is about 10,000 years ago and uh, India is the largest democracy in the world and about the sixth largest country in the world. And uh, of course, uh, the education system is also quite ancient in India. The world first university was uh, established in Takshila about 700 BC with the Indian mathematicians uh, introduced very vital concepts like zero, decimal system, multiplication etc. Which nobody in the world can deny the importance of the Indian education system because what it has given to India as well as to the world is uh, has got no comparison. It is beyond comparison of course. Then uh, of course, we talked about the how education system is controlled in India. It is controlled by the central government which provides the financial assistance and from the years from 6 to 14, uh, the education is free as far as the government is concerned. It does a lot of uh, education planning in this regard and uh, when you cross 14, of course, it is a paid system which is again, uh, we have some important uh, you know terms and the conditions for the, for the underprivileged people wherein the government thinks about them and try and uh, you know build that system again. Then of course, we talked about the higher education in India has evolved and of course, is a divergent and distinct streams where each stream is monitored by an apex body directly controlled by the Ministry of Human Resource Development. Then uh, we talked about uh, that uh, mostly universities are funded by the state government and few are funded by the central government and uh, you need to have the approval of AICTE and the modern uh, India has go got deep roots. Uh, in the ancient education system which uh, definitely uh, the personal growth is promoted uh, through the awareness and creation of the self attainment of pure bliss. How this, this is uh, attained through culture, through heritage and through the value system. If uh, as an individual you have a value system in mind, nobody can uh, you know uh, force you to do wrong things because you are on a right track, you are on a right path wherein the ethical uh, deep thinking is embedded in the mind of the people, then of course, it uh, uh, you know creates a system of uh, wisdom into you and wherein you become more responsible citizen. And uh, whatever uh, value system we have in the ancient uh, education system is derived from the religion, from the uh, you know the, the law and uh, of course, uh, whatever path you adopt uh, leads you and takes you to the path of salvation, which is the most difficult thing in the world to achieve. And uh, we talked about a very intimate relationship of a teacher and a pupil which is developed by you know the uh, the Upanayas that is a new birth when a, when a child is uh, you know given to uh, a teacher uh, the value system is attained a good uh, thought process is attained etc. And according to the value system propounded by the Hinduism moksha or a spiritual amanification is the ultimate goal of life which is definitely very difficult to achieve. For this purpose, the ancient Hindu culture was divided into you know the four ashrams. The first was Brahmacharya, the second is Grihasth, the third is Manaprasth, and the fourth is Sanyasa. Now, uh, every uh, you know the the ashram has its own obligations to perform and to fulfill. India has a rich tradition of learning and uh, you know learning and education system and. Uh, 
These were handed over, over from generations to generations through the oral and the written medium. The highly esteemed Vedas that existed uh, nearly 2000 years before they are known in India which guides our present lives and the knowledge of acoustics. Acoustics enable the ancient uh, Indians to orally transmit the Vedas from generation to generation. The institutional form of imparting the knowledge came into existence in early centuries of the Christian era and uh, of course uh, the way of learning was uh, basically to study the logic and epistemology and the study of the logic uh, you know followed by the Buddhist uh, you know Hindus and the Jains and uh, you know the one of the most important topics of the Indian thought was Pramana that is the evidence because uh, you know people across the world they believe in a particular thing if you have the the evidence in front of you that is the pramana so the main indian thought process was centering around the pramana then uh, of course uh, we had a educational and the institutional system called guru shishya system wherein uh, the the sacred tests were endorsed uh, in the mind of the pupils and if it's a brahmin pupil he will be taught by a brahmin teacher and uh, the first thing they were taught was uh, the Gayatri Mantra wherein it is considered to be most powerful uh, thought and of course uh, the family functioned as a as a domestic school to them and the uh, you know the ashrama or the hermitage where the mental faculties of the pupils were developed by the kind attention and the continuous attention of the teachers and of course the personal tutoring of that individual. The, the education system was treated as a matter of an individual concern and uh, every teacher used to try and uh, put his heart and soul into the mind of the pupils to inculcate his mental capabilities and abilities and make him a good person with innate with the latent uh, capability, capabilities uh, to be around. The, this view of education as a process uh, of one's inner growth and the self-fulfillment evolve its own techniques, rules, methods and practices. Everyone in this world, they have their own particular methods and techniques to be endorsed, to be adopted, to, to be practiced, uh, so that uh, whatever teachings we give to an individual uh, are the best. Now, we are coming on to a very vital part of today's lecture, that is the teaching of Upanishads. Now, the teachings of Upanishads are as follows. They are very interesting and good to know. So, every student should now pay attention on what Upanishads are, what specific teachings the Upanishads gives us. The first is Nishkama Karma, that is, it speaks about a duty to act but not a right to claim the fruits from it. That is, it is your duty to do the karma. You have to do what you are supposed to do, what is being obligatory from you to perform, do it, but never expect the results to come and never expects the fruit to take. The trees, the sun, the rivers are the living examples of performance of full swadharma and not expecting any, anything in return. The sun gives a sunshine to everyone every day. We wait for the mornings to come. It gives you a sunshine without any condition. Similarly, the river gives us the water irrespective of whether you are underprivileged, rich or poor. So, the sun and the rivers are the living examples of Swadharma, that is whatever your dharma is, perform. Whatever your dharma is, do it, but do not expect anything in return. Now, it helps in the inner purification and realization of the self, that is the self, real self. That is whatever you do, it gives you a inner satisfaction, the inner peace and if your if your deeds are right, if your deeds are good, nobody can even harm you anywhere. The universe will come for your rescue. So, do your duties, do your obligations, do your swadharma in your own way without expecting anything in return. This is the concept of nishkam karma. If you are on a path of nishkam karma, that is you are doing for a society, you are doing anything good for the people, you are purifying yourself, you are not expecting anything in return. So, you become a blessed soul, you become, you know, uh, you know, your purification is done in, in, in an inner way and you are on a very right path which you have adopted without having any expectations from anyone without expecting any fruits from anyone. It is a kind of a bliss, bliss 
in a way of external, relative, internal, competitive, the rewards can never bring. Bliss is a state of a salvation wherein you feel yourself that you are doing the best for the society, you are doing so good for the society but you are not expecting anything from in return from them. So if you are in a, that state of a bliss, that's, that state of a bliss cannot be bought with any amount of money which is available in the society. So do your best, do the nishkam karma, the, the good things will come to you. Now the second most important teaching of what Upanishads give us is work is worship. Work can lead to attainment of spiritual goals. If you are a teacher, teach your students without any you know expectations from them in terms of greed of money, greed of fees etc. Because in that case you will not be able to achieve anything in life because you are doing uh, your work conditionally or you are expecting something in return. But yes take work as worship, do everything from heart and soul, then see the magic, then see the results, you will be a more happier person with lot of inner peace, with lot of bliss which nothing can buy. So do your swadharma, do your work, do your duties, do your obligations without any kind of expectations from anyone. The third is help others. It is a virtue. Do not harass others it is a sin. If you harass others, you have to pay a lot of uh, you know price for it because if you, the, if the person is suffering, he will not give you good wishes, he will always give you bad wishes. So that is a kind of uh, you know the karma which you have to face, uh, that is a kind of a situation which you have to face and you will be in sin and of course if you try and harass others, it is a kind of your uh, inner peace disturbance also because at the back of the mind you will always feel that you know I am doing good to others but they are not going do, doing good to me so uh, nothing good words will come out of your mind in fact you will always be giving them some kind of a bad wishes and of course everything here is a kind of a negative uh, thing which has to be stopped and it is a sin to harm others never harm others do the best what you can do for yourself for your society for the public at large because if you good do good do uh, good to the others, the good things will happen to you. The good things will come to you. The God will come for your rescue. The universe uh, will come for your rescue. But yes, if you do harm to others, it's a kind of a sin, and every particular work which you do is accountable. If you do good, it is accountable. If you do bad, it is accountable. So Upanishads give us this value system that if you are surviving in this world, one do a nishkam karma wherein do not expect anything from anyone. The second is do not harm any anyone because it is a kind of a sin. Third, work is your worship that is whatever you do, you do it from your heart and soul. Worship it like as a god without any expectations, without any greed, without any money. Then you should help others because helping is a virtue. Be, in, uh, be it in terms of money, be it in terms of food, shelter, etc. Do not harass others. It is a sin to, a sin to be called. Then self-motivation and self-development leads to excellence of work. You should you know, try and train yourself, talk to yourself, talk to your inner self. Do a kind of an analysis when you are sitting alone. Whether what you are doing is right, whether your acts are resulting in good, do it. If your results are if your work and your act is not resulting in good to others, stop it. You are the best master of your own life. You are the best analyst ever. So try and sit with yourself, talk to yourself, talk to your inner self. Try and analyze your particular acts that whatever act you are doing, is it harming anyone? Stop it immediately. If you are not you know, doing anything which is harming anyone, please go ahead. Spread smiles spread help it's good for the others it is not a sin at all but if you try and harm others it's a sin and nishkam karma is the best thing which the upanishads are teaching us try and motivate yourself because the self motivation is the best motivation ever you will be motivated from the inner self so try and make your inner self happy if your inner self is happy you will always be on a right path you will always be motivated, you are self-motivated 
and of course you then you will start working towards the self development of an individual which is definitely good and that is the only path for the excellence ever. Last but not the least the entire world is one family that is the Vasudeva Kutumba that is if you take everyone as your friend and a family that means the whole world is your family. You should never demarcate that this is my room, this is my family because the whole world is your family somewhere or the other deep roots we are connected to each other. If you have this kind of a feeling that is the whole world is your family you will never do anything wrong to anyone because nobody can harm your own family. So try and have this kind of a feeling which the Upanishads teaches us that the whole world is one family that is Vasudeva Kutumba. So let me give you a recap of the teachings of the Upanishads which we have done now. The first is Nishkama Karma, it speaks about the duty to act but not the right to claim the fruits from it. You are supposed to do what you are supposed to do, what you are obligatory to do, what you are you know, uh, you know obligations are there must perform it. But the other aspect is never perform the results out of it. So the first is Nishkama Karma which speaks about only the duty that do your act diligently with your heart and soul without harming anyone without expectations. The you know the living examples are trees, the trees gives fruits to everyone, it gives you know the calm to everyone, it gives the oxygen to everyone without having any demarcation that this is an underprivileged person or a poor person or a rich person. Similarly the sun and the river, the trees, sun, rivers are the living examples of Nishkama Karma, they give, they flow, they give fruits to everyone without expecting that they, they will be watered or they will be given some kind of assistance. They are just performing and going with the wind, going with the flow. The similar message is endorsed from the Upanishads to the individuals that you must perform what you are supposed to do without expecting anything from anyone. And of course when you do this it is a kind of a inner bliss, it is a kind of a purification of your own self, of your, of your inner self. So, which is uh, you know most expensive thing in this world because uh, you know this inner peace and uh, uh, this kind of a happiness which is uh, you know a food for your soul cannot be bought from any market and cannot be bought from any shop. It is a kind of a uh, you know the, the inculcations uh, which is uh, because of the Upanishads the teachings are like such that you are happy from your inner self. Then of course the second teaching is work is worship that is put your heart and soul in whatever work you do help others because it is a kind of a virtue and uh, you know harming anyone is a vice. So when you are harming anyone you have to be accountable to the God that yes this is a bad thing which I am doing. The God keeps a account of every good and every bad act. So try and add more virtues than vices in your account. Then of course try and uh, you know keep yourself self motivated <coughs> because the self motivation and the self development is the only way for the work of the excellence which you can move on and of course you should have this kind of a feeling that the entire world is yours and that is the Vasudeva Kutumba. Now there are 10 major Upanishads they are as follows. So we will be talking about the types of the Upanishads we have already talked about the teachings which the Upanishads gives us. Now we will talk about the types of the Upanishads which are available in the Indian heritage culture. The first is Isha. It deals with the philosophy of God and God realization that is the Isha. The second is Kina. Kina deals with the sacrifices and other forms of worships. The third is the Katha. It records the question and the answers Yama and Nachiketa. The fourth is Prashana that is it involves the questions what is the root cause of the universe, functioning of the vital force of life etc. So we have talked about here the four types that is the Isha, Kina, Katha and Prashna. Let us do it once again, Isha deals with the philosophy of God and God's realization and the second is the Kina which deals with the sacrifices and other forms of worship. Third is the Katha, it records the question and the answers of Yama and Nachiketa. And the, and the fourth is the prashna that is it uh, you know answers the questions like what is the root cause of universe functioning of a vital force of life etc. The fifth is the Kaushitaki 
it explains the course of souls after death it makes clear the doctrine of prana and makapsha the sixth is mandukaya it explains the nirakar aspects of god that is we see and we think that we do not have any physical form and shape of the god then we have taitriyara it tells in detail about the creation of god then we have aitriyaya that is it describes the atman and the births of atma then we have chandagoya it explains the sacrifices and other forms of worship and the last is the bruhadharmiya kyaka it deals with the negotiations of all conceptions of self what does it mean the vedas originated from the world vid which means to know vedas means knowledge and as scriptures vedas signifies the books of knowledge they teach the work ethics and knowledge which should be followed by us another classification of shrutis is vedas there are four vedas in hindu scriptures the first is the rigveda the second is a yajur veda the third is sam veda and the fourth is atharva veda so we'll be talking about all these four vedas in the indian scriptures and the shrutis is vedas one by one what is a rig veda it deals with the general knowledge what is a yajur veda it deals with the knowledge of action sam veda it deals with the knowledge of worship followed by atharva veda which deals with the knowledge of science now we come come upon the ancient scriptures which are available in the hindu culture the ancient education was based on the sacred scriptures they are shrutis and smritis now we'll be talking about each one of them one by one what is a shruti shrutis are the foundation of the indo hindu traditions they explain that external truth is realized by investors of truth that is sex shrutis are technically classified into four groups mantra brahmana anaraya and upanishads they are also arranged as rigveda yajurveda samaveda and atharvaveda now we called on smritis they are also called as purushastra they explain the external principles and the process for the current lifestyle and integrated welfare the smritis include the following the first is the panth what is a panth these includes kalpa sutra in jainism dhammapad triputas in buddhism guru granth sahib in sikhism so they are called as panths now we are called on as puranas there are about 18 puranas and 46 up, uh, up puranas which explain that is the virtue that is the punya to help others and sip pap to harm others punya is a virtue which helps to get the freedom from suffering and pain and promotes the spiritual progress and we, then we have a pap that is the sin which is caused about the pain and the suffering of others and block one's own spiritual progress that is the asthadas puranesu vyasu vachan dwam and parokesi punyam papaya paridham then we have agamas that is they include the shakta shavya jain and vaishnavas now we call upon uh, the the upanishads they includes the shilpa dhanur gandharva and ayur what is a shilpa they explain that is the shilpa that is the they explain the the architecture dhanur they explain the defense then we have gandharva they explain the music followed by ayur they explain a system of medicine then we have a darshana that is the word darshana is derived from a darshan which means to see they contain the observations of the ancient sages which they see and experience they explain the philosophy of life and contain the principles of guide one's own life followed by there are six creation of six system of philosophy which each philosophy is associated with the name and the principle of the interpreter these are what the first is 
Vaishya Shikha, that is the Kannada, it contains the science of logic and futility of Maya. Then we have Nyaya, that is the Gautanana, it explains the logical quest for God and phases of creation. Then we have a Yoga, that is the Patanjali, it contains the practice for meditation and Samadhi for renunciation. Then we have Sankaya, that is a Kapil, it explains the liberation by elimination of the physical and the mental pains. Then we have a Vedanta, that is the Ved Vyasa. It explains the divine nature of soul, Maya and creation. Then we have Mimayas, that is the Gemini. It explains the Vedas are external and divine. Now the teachings of Darshan, that is the Darshanas, provided the knowledge of one supreme consciousness. It explains that all our actions lead to the same end. They are verified truth, verified in the laboratory and confirmed by others. The Gayatri Mantra developed when sun was conceptualized as a source of all energy. This was verified when the growth of plants was seen as a dependent on a sunlight. Brahman was seen as the ultimate reality which was one and primary. All other members were derived from the supreme reality. Then we have Vinganas, they contain the following Vyakarana, Shiksha, Jyotisha, Nirukata, Chanda and Kalpa Sutra. Now when you talk about the first that is the Vyukarna, it explains the, the Sanskrit grammar. Shiksha needs how to pronounce the Vedic mantras. Jyotisha explains the science of astronomy and astro astrology. Nirukata is a Vedic dictionary. Chanda contains the poetic stranzas and Kalpa Sutra explains the related to performance of the Vedic religion. So with this I hope uh, the, the concept of Puranas, Upanishads and the teachings about the Nishkama Karma etc is very clear to you that it is a kind of a pure bliss, no money can buy it, it is a kind of a worship, you should take work as worship, help others, motivate yourself and of course you, you can see the entire world as one family that is the Vasudeva Kutumba. Because whatever the Upanishads, the Smritis and uh, the other uh, cultural heritage uh, concepts can give you, nobody else can give you and it is a kind of uh, a thing which is not available in the market, no money can buy it. But you must have a clear understanding of what these uh, Upanishads, Smritis etc, mantras are and take the fullest advantage and use it in the modern contemporary world of today. With this note, thank you so much. Thank you ma'am, thank you so very much for giving us this uh, session and uh, friends we believe that your feedbacks are very very important for us. Do write to us at info.cc at nic.in. We will try to give answers to your questions too if you post uh, any and uh, we will try to give answers in our forthcoming session when Dr. Namita Rajput visits our studio. Till then take care, goodbye. Thank you ma'am, thank you so very much.